Okay, th this morning I just want to teach about musical instruments. So you'll notice that in our church we don't have musical instruments, we don't have a pianist, we don't have you know, a guitarist or anything like that. And it's, it's not so much because we don't have the talent. I mean, we, we don't actually, I don't think, <laughs> right now. But I'm just saying that that's not the reason why. Even if we did have the talent, uh, the only musical instrument I want in this church, my position right now anyway would be you guys. You guys are the only musical instruments we have. So we don't have mechanical, right, or, or machine type uh, musical instruments. And I just wanted to explain today the reasoning behind why I actually chose not to have musical instruments in this church. It's a position, it's a position I came to when I was studying it out and thinking about it of how to actually run this church. So when, when um, we were planning this church out, I was thinking, you know, all the different things I would do, you know, how I would have it, where we would have it. So everything that you're experiencing by being part of this church is, is all the positions and convictions that I came to uh, before starting it. And obviously, some things can change. That's fine. But I just wanted to explain, because you, you're probably thinking, oh, you know, sometimes it's weird on Sunday mornings. It's a bit quiet. There's no, like, interlude music when things are happening. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are not used to a cappella singing, right, in church. Most people are used to going to church and singing with musical instruments. So I wanted to take the time today, this morning, just to explain my position on musical instruments and why uh, we don't have them. And you know, the position might be a bit of a shock to you, but there, you know, there are a lot of people that take this position because um, it might be a bit of a shock to you because it's just something that we're so used to, right? And, and, and when you think of musical instruments, what, what, what do you first think about? You think about the, the, the verses in Psalms, right? They say, praise the Lord on an instrument of 10 strings. Well, I'm going to get to those um, in this sermon. But uh, let's just go first of all and just look at all the New Testament scriptures about music and about singing. And, you know, there's so little in the New Testament about music and singing that we'll go through every verse this morning and just show you um, what, what verses there even are in the New Testament regarding uh, music and singing. So first of all, the first category of verses in the, in the New Testament um, are the commands, right? The commands to actually s sing. So we see the first one here in Ephesians 5.19. It says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Some people ask, what's the difference between a psalm, a hymn and a spiritual song? I don't really know if there is a difference. I mean, my position is it's just three different words for the same thing. I think God is just repeating, you know, and, and in a poetic sense. But maybe there is a difference. I don't know. But, you know, I, I think a psalm is a hymn, is a spiritual song. That's my opinion. Um, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And as we go to these different verses, I just want you to notice what you see commanded and what you don't see commanded. Uh, let's go to Colossians 3.16, which is the parallel passage to that verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Um, let's go to James. 5.13, and I would consider this one a, a command. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. So there's a command to sing psalms, or I guess an allowance to sing psalms, if you are joyful. And one thing to note there is, you know, and I'll touch on this on, in my next sermon as well, but because I don't believe music is for entertainment, you'll notice here it says, if you're merry, sing psalms. It doesn't say sing psalms in order to be merry. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's that the emotion comes first and then to express that emotion you sing as opposed to a song controlling the emotion. Uh, okay, so they're, they're the commands, right? So they're the, the sing, the psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. If you're merry, sing psalms. Now let, let's look at the um, examples. So examples in the New Testament scriptures where people um, sang songs. Um, and this is at the, the, the Last Supper with Jesus. So after he had uh, broken bread and drank of the cup, it says here in verse 30 in Matthew 26, and when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Um, we see a similar passage in Mark 14, 26. And when they had sung an hymn, 
they went out into the Mount of Olives. Again, the singing. Acts 16. If you're familiar with this passage, this is when Paul and Silas were thrown into jail. And it says here, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And then there was the miracle of the doors breaking open and they were able, all, people were able to get out. Another example, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, about the gifts in the church. It says here, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So again, singing. Um, now we do see instruments in the New Testament scriptures, but we only see them in Revelation. And we'll go to those verses here, Revelation 5, 8 and 9. And one thing I want you to take note of um, is the location in Revelation where musical instruments are used. Now they're not used in earth, are they? Because this is a vision of John in heaven seeing the heavenly temple, the, the real temple of God in heaven. And this is where the instruments are being played. But well, we'll look at these verses here, Revelation 5, 8 and 9. And I'll come back to these in the sermon. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps. So these twenty-four elders, um, which are around in the throne, they each have them, uh, them. They each have a harp, and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, "Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation." So that's Revelation 5, 8 and 9. And we see some other, and we'll go to all of them, just for today. So Revelation 14, 2 and 3. This is the, another example in Revelation in heaven where uh, instruments are being used to praise God. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. I always find that phrase funny because it's like, how obvious. I mean, of course, harpers are going to harp with their harps, but... Um, <laughs> And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Um, so there's harpers harping with their harps. And then Revelation 15, 2. We see here, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So again, this is in the, the, the temple in heaven uh, where that is being sung. And you can go back and look at those verses. You want. I just wanted to show you the different locations, music and singing appear in the New Testament scriptures. I'll address the Old Testament scriptures in a second or in a minute. All right, here's some more. So Luke 15, 25, this is the story of the prodigal son. So after he returns back, and you remember he, the fatted calf is killed and gives him the coat and the ring, the father, and says, says, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Now I've labeled these verses. So we've got the commands in the New Testament. Then we've got the examples of people singing in the New Testament, which is with Jesus and his apostles and Paul and Silas in prison. Then we've got the examples in Revelation where instruments are used in the heavenly temple. I've labeled these verses as verses that are, are not relevant to the topic, but mention the topic. Um, and the reason why you know, it's, it, it mentions the topic is it mentions music, right? But it's not relevant because it's, it's, it's not really about how church, you know, what the disciples did or what we do in church. It's a parable where they're celebrating with music and things like that. It has a, a different meaning to it. So that's an example in the, in the pro parable of the prodigal son where he comes back and then there's a celebration and that's, there's music and dancing. Um, Romans 15.9. I'll just read from verse 5. It says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded like one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. And I believe the context here is Jews and Gentiles being like-minded. 
um, that you may that you may be that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Now the reason why I put this into the category of not relevant but addresses the topic because this is a quote from Psalms but the reason why this psalm is being quoted is not because of the singing. It's being quoted because he's saying that Jesus Christ was a minister to the Jews but he also was going to reach to the Gentiles and then he's quoting the psalm saying that He's going to sing among the Gentiles. So the, the, the point that I believe this psalm is being quoted is because it's talking about the Gentiles, not the fact that it's singing. But even so, I mean, this psalm still only says singing. It says nothing about instruments, so it still doesn't support the other view. Uh, the other one is in Hebrews 2, where again it mentions the psalm about singing, but the reason why I think it's not relevant to the topic it says here, uh, 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 where did it say it was not? So I didn't put this one in my notes, but uh, it was not. Oh, here we go. Verse 11, so that's just before. So Hebrews 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. So even though this psalm mentions singing praise in the church, I believe the reason why Paul is quoting this psalm is not because of the singing. He's quoting it because he's trying to show that Jesus Christ referred to both Jews and Gentiles as brethren, right? It says, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. And then he just quotes the rest of the psalm. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So... Those are, as far as I know, unless I've missed one, those are all the passages in the New Testament that address music, that address singing, uh, that address musical instruments. Uh, not, not very much at all. And that's not to say that it's less important. I'm not, I'm not basing an argument based on uh, if, it's, if it's mentioned few times, therefore it's less important and it doesn't matter. Uh, all I'm saying is it's not a big topic in the New Testament. There are a lot of other scriptures about a lot of other things where it is um, mentioned a lot more. So let's go on to the question, you know, so why, why, I don't, why don't I have musical instruments in church for singing? Well, here's a couple of reasons, and I'll go through my reasoning with you, and um, you can decide whether or not you agree. So first of all, the first thing that struck me and even made me reconsider my position, I mean, it is the fact that the New Testament Gospels and letters only have examples of Jesus and the disciples singing. Like of all the verses that we went through, even if we, even if we include the, the not relevant verses, um, there, there's no example of Jesus or the disciples using musical instruments. Now if you think about it, in churches today, music is such a huge part, isn't it? I mean, music is a huge part of the gathering, isn't it? And, and you would think if God expected the gathering and the music of the saints in the church to be like an orchestra, which is what it's like in some churches, you know, you've got the violins, the cellos, and the trump, like they, they, they've got this orchestra happening. Wouldn't you think there'd be at least one mention of somebody holding an instrument or the, the musicians or, the, or something in there, right? But it's not mentioned once. That never is there somebody in the New Testament church or Jesus and his disciples ever carrying an instrument or their instruments being present, nothing there. Uh, and that was the thing that really caught my attention when I started thinking about this. I'm just thinking, why, why, why is there nothing mentioned? Surely there's something mentioned. If we were to practice um, church singing uh, like a lot of churches do today, because we do see a lot of things in the New Testament, right? We see the breaking of bread. Right, the breaking of bread is mentioned in the Lord's Supper. Um, we see baptism done. We see soul winning. We see preaching. We see prayer and fasting. These are all things for the New Testament church to do. And we see examples of the disciples doing that. But we see examples of the disciples singing, but no instruments at all. Never once mentioned. That's the first red flag for me. That's not the reason why I don't have musical instruments, but that's what started, uh, that got me thinking about this. 
So that's number one. Number two is, um, let's just go to Ephesians 5. I'll go back to that verse. Point number two is musical instruments cannot fill the commandments that we do see in the New Testament because we have clear commandments to sing and the purpose for why we are to sing. And if we look at those purposes, musical instruments don't fulfill any of those purposes. It says Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we see here that the, the reason that we sing is to speak to one another. But if I'm playing an instrument, right, how is that speaking to somebody? It's not speaking to you because it doesn't say any words, right? So a musical instrument does not speak. It doesn't speak to you. It doesn't speak to another person because it doesn't say any words. And we're not talking about in the artistic sense, right? When you say like musicians, they're like, oh, this music really speaks to me. No, we're talking about it actually speaks words. And, and the reason why we say that is because when we go to Colossians 3, right? Colossians 3.16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So again, the words. So songs are to remind us of the words of God. And look at this, teaching and admonishing one another. So again, musical instruments don't preach the word of God. They don't teach. They don't admonish. Like teaching is, is so you learn something. Admonishing is to, to correct you in something. Um, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing. So musical instruments don't sing. Like, like the voice does, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, somebody might say, well, it's singing and making melody. And they'll say musical instruments make melody. But where is the making melody meant to take place? It's making melody in your heart. So a musical instrument doesn't make melody in your heart, does it? A musical instrument makes melody in a location. Um, so you see that the, new, that the musical instruments, they, they don't do what we are explicitly commanded to do in the New Testament. And there's, like I said, there's not much said about singing and musical instruments in the New Testament. But what is said and what is commanded is singing and speaking to yourselves, teaching and admonishing one another, singing with grace in your heart, singing with melody in your heart to the Lord. So they don't sing, they don't teach, they don't admonish, they don't speak, they don't make melody in your heart. That's number two. Uh, number three, so let's, let's get on to the more in-depth one, and, and this is probably where, where the crux of the argument is, is how do we explain then the Psalms in the Old Testament, right? Because if, if there are explicit Psalms in the Old Testament saying, praise the Lord with instruments, praise the Lord on the, the high sounding cymbals and, and things like that, how do we explain those? Well, there are Psalms that have passages that seem to support, and I say seem because I don't believe you can consistently defend this position, but that have psalms that, that seem to support musical instruments in the worship of God in the church. And we'll go to a couple of those. So if we go to Psalm 33. Oops, Psalm 33. Here's one. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with the harp. So here's, they, say, they say, look, it's, it's explicit. It's saying there, praise God with the musical instruments. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Psalm 33. So let's go to Psalm 92, another example. It says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound. I'll give you another one. 147. It says here, Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. So there are passages in the Psalms, and I don't doubt this, there's passages in the Psalms that where David is telling people to praise God with instruments. Now, some people might say, you know, how can you, because this is one objection, right? They'll say, how can you be commanded to sing the Psalms when the Psalms say, praise God with an instrument of ten strings, right? So you're going to sing this song saying, praise God with an instrument of ten strings, and yet you're not going to use an instrument with ten strings. They'll say, oh, that's kind of that's odd, right? Because you're, you're like singing about something that you're not actually going to do. Like you. So that, that's a valid point, right? So, I mean, two things there, right? You know, one is, you know, we're not command I don't believe we're commanded to sing the Psalms. You know, the Bible says speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we're meant to be singing spiritual songs, and a Psalm is a spiritual song. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to sing the Psalms. I'm not against singing the Bible. I'm just saying that's, I don't think that's what we're being commanded to do because obviously singing the Bible, you know, like Muslims sing the Quran, right? There's, there's benefits to it to help you memorize the Bible, to help you meditate on the Bible and to reflect on the Bible that if you put it to song, it's easier for you to do that. So I'm all for singing the Bible for the purposes of memorization and edification. I just don't think we're commanded necessarily to do that. But anyways, but even in the Psalms, there are things in the Psalms that we don't necessarily do anyway. So if we're going to sing the Psalms, it can't just be about the musical instruments. I mean, there's things about war, there's things about the temple. I mean, we don't do those things either. So um, how can we just say, well, we have to do the instruments if we're going to sing the Psalms, but not anything else. And that's really my second point. My second point is, you know, people that take the position that we ought to have musical instruments in church because the Psalms command it, they don't even follow their own, you know, like Kevin always says, you've got to play by the rules, right? I mean, if you're going to set a rule and say, hey, the Psalms command us to use musical instruments and then you don't even follow your own rule, which is if the Psalms command something, we ought to do it, then, then it's probably not a rule that's correct. There needs to be another way to understand it if you're not following it consistently. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's go to... Um, Psalm 150. Because this is another passage that tells us to praise the Lord with musical instruments. But I want you to notice what else is in the psalm as well. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Now I'll prove this to you later, but the sanctuary is talking about the tabernacle. Right? And in David's time, the tabernacle then changed to the temple. Now, do we praise God in the sanctuary? Like, is God commanding us that we must praise Him in a holy building? No, because the church is not a building anymore. Ye, ye are the holy temple of God. We praise God with melody in our heart. So, we, if, if we're going to say praise God with instruments, are you going to praise God in a holy place as well when that holy place doesn't even exist anymore? Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. So this is where we probably support what they're saying, right? They're saying, oh, look at all these instruments. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Look at this. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Now how, now how many churches do you know that are for musical instruments will dance as well? Now, now none of them do. Now some, some of them do. I've been to Pentecostal churches where they do dance, right? And they're, and they're singing and dancing. You know, at least they're following this consistently. They're like David, dancing with all their might. I remember when I went to this Pentecostal church, and I don't know if every Pentecostal church has this guy in it, but there's this, always this one guy at the front, and he's just like dancing like crazy. And you're just thinking like, why is this guy not at the front with the singers? Like, why is he always in the audience? So I remember going to this Pentecostal church. This guy was always at the front. He was dancing crazy. Um, so maybe they're following this consistently, but I think most independent fundamental Baptist churches are not dancing, right? And they think it's a sin if you dance in church. So, you know, I say that if somebody has the position where they're going to praise God with musical instruments saying they take this commandment from the Psalms, then I want to see some dancing. You know what I mean? And if they're going to tell me that it's a sin not to use musical instruments in church, then I say it's a sin if they're not dancing. Because the commandment is there to praise Him with the timbrel and dance. So dance, my friend. But they don't dance, right? They don't follow this. So they're not consistent with how they uh, preach this commandment, right? Because they say, look, it's commanded. It's clear that we should praise Him with instruments. Um, it's also clear that you should praise Him with dance. Praise Him in the sanctuary. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Look at this one. This is Psalm 149. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and praise and His praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in Him and, and in Him that made Him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their King. Look, let them praise His name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Look at this one. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. So you expect me now to, to, to yield a sword when I'm singing praises unto God? So, you know, obviously, you know, we have to understand these psalms in light of the New Testament scriptures. And I mean, that is, and I'm not addressing this topic today, but you know, that is a question that comes up is how do we differentiate, you know, what, what we do keep and what we don't keep. And it's not that we just choose what we like and disregard what we don't like. We can't, I come to these positions because we need to understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. 
right? So we can't just see a statement. And that's why I say we, we interpret stories in the Bible with statements, but statement in light of the New Testament. Because if you take a statement from the Old Testament and run with it, then you're going to command people to use instruments in the church, church gathering when you're not being cons consistent with how you're applying that. Because the Psalms also command us to praise God with dance and praise God with other things that we don't do these days. Um, so how do we understand these? Well, let's, let's look at where instruments even came from when it comes to uh, worshipping the Lord in the house of God. Um, and the first thing I want to show you, or not show you, but I'm just going to go to First Chronicles 17. I won't turn to the other passage, but in Exodus 36 to 39, we read about the very detailed instructions that God gave Moses and then Moses passed on to Bezalel and company in order to build the tabernacle. So they built the tent, they built the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid it with gold, they built the candlesticks and the bowls and the plates and everything to do with the tabernacle. And one thing you'll notice um, that God did not tell them to build with the tabernacle was musical instruments. So God told them to build all these things in the worship and in the service of the house of the Lord, but didn't tell them to build any musical instruments. So where did the musical instruments come from? Well, I want to show you here that, see, oh, okay, so what I wanted to say was, so originally God had commanded Moses to build a tabernacle, didn't he? So the tabernacle is, is a tent. And we read here in 1 Chronicles 17 why God commanded a tabernacle to be built. Um, or, why, or actually, that, that God commanded a tabernacle to be built and not the temple that David built. Uh, well, that David got his son Solomon to build. So in 1 Chronicles 17, let's read here. It says, Now it came to pass as David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars. So cedars uh, is a type of wood. But the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains, referring to the tabernacle. So if you, if you read the preceding chapters, David has basically just established his throne and he's built himself a nice house of cedars. And he's like saying, hey man, I, I live in such a nice house. But, you know, God's ark of the covenant just lives in this tent. You know, I want to build a house for God. Then, said, then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. Now this is interesting, because you know, you know in verse 2, David says to Nathan, Hey, I want to build God a house. And what does Nathan say? Do all that is in thy heart, God is with thee. Now that wasn't very discerning of Nathan, right? Because he wasn't, he wasn't seeing what was the will of God. And, and, some, and I just wanted to bring up this point because, you know, sometimes we are a bit like that. Like we are not discerning and we tend to judge an idea or a doctrine based on the person that is preaching it rather than whether it lines up with the word of God. So it's like David has this idea. He says, I want to build God this house. And Nathan says, great, I'm all for it because God's with you. You're a man of God. How can you be wrong? And then, what, and then what happens? God comes to him and says, tell David, no, don't build the house. So basically, Nathan, you're wrong. Uh, I don't want David to build a house for me. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting point, right? Because sometimes we're like that. We need to be discerning, right? We need to make sure that what is right lines up with the Word of God, not just lines up with somebody you believe is being used of God. Um, Go and tell David, my servant, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel unto this day, but I've gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. And I believe the reason why God had a tabernacle and not a, a building is because I think he's showing that uh, it, it was a temporary dwelling place for God, right? So Because a tabernacle is something that you set up temporarily to stay. A temple or a house is something where you are permanently going to build there. So the, ta so the things of heaven, the altar and all the, the Ark of the Covenant and things that are in the real temple of God, God commanded Moses to build in a tabernacle, I think symbolizing the fact that it was temporary um, because the real temple is in God, uh, is in heaven. Um, Gone from ten to ten, from one tabernacle to another. Wheresoever I ever walked with all Israel, spake I a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people, saying, Why have ye not built me a house of cedars? 
So he's saying, like, have I ever said to any of the leaders before you, why, why, why aren't you guys building me a house? No, right? Because he wanted them to worship in the tabernacle as, as he had commanded. Now, therefore, thus shalt, thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, even from following the sheep, that thou shouldest be ruler over my people Israel. So he's saying, you were a follower of sheep, and now you're ruling over my sheep. I have been with thee whithersoever thou hast walked, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and have made thee a name like the name of the great men that are in the earth. Also, I will ordain a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and they shall dwell in their place, and shall be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more, as at the beginning. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, moreover I will subdue all thine enemies. Furthermore, I tell thee that the Lord will build thee a house. So God is saying here, you want to build me a house? I didn't command you to build me a house. In fact, I'm going to build you a house one day. Um, I will build thee a house, verse 10. And it shall come to pass when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house. So it's interesting that he says, God, I'm going to build the house. And then he's saying, Jesus will build the house. So there's a sort of reference to the deity of Christ there. He shall build me a house. And I will, establish, I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. And I will settle him in mine house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forevermore. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Now this is interesting, and, and this is not really a point in my sermon, but just something I've been considering. So I'm not sure whether this is right yet, but I just want to let you know this is something I've been thinking about. It's interesting here that when we read, when God says, I'm going to build you a house, and in fact your seed is going to get raised up after you, and he's going to build the house. We know, reading this from a New Testament point of view, that that's talking about Jesus Christ, right? Because he's throne is going to be established forever and we know that Solomon's throne was not established forever and what is interesting about this and and you have to correct me if I'm wrong because I, I, I was just thinking about this last night when when you see so we see first of all that God intended a tabernacle he never intended a temple David wanted to build God a temple God tells David no I am going to build you a house you're not going to build me a house and in fact your seed after you which is Jesus Christ is going to raise up his throne is going to be established forever. There'll be, it'll be a kingdom of peace. He will build the house. What's interesting about that, and I don't have these verses in my notes, but you can read it up about later. When, when David says to Solomon that God told him to build a house, and do you remember how, how, for those of you who are familiar with the story, David says, you know, God didn't allow me to build the house because I was a man of war. There was a lot of bloodshed. And then God told me that Solomon was going to build the house. And then Solomon, even at the dedication of the temple, repeats that. And he said that God told David that because he was a man of war, God did not have him to build the house, but I am raised up. I am fulfilling that prophecy that I am raised up and I am building this house. And that was the dedication of the temple. Now, what's interesting is that that encounter with God, where God told him not to build the house, this is it in 1, Corinthians 7, in 1 Chronicles 17. But was there anything about David being a man of war and that's the reason why not to build a house? that Solomon was going to build the house? No, right? There, there was just God saying, you know, I never intended for you to build a house. I wanted you to build a tabernacle. And your seed after you, which is Jesus Christ, is going to build the house. I'm going to build the house for you. So I just wonder, when it comes to the building of the temple, did David misinterpret what God told him? Like, was it David that thought that God had said to him, like, this is why you're not going to build it, as opposed to God never intended a house to be built. And when he said your seed was going to build it, David just thought, well, Solomon's taking over my reign, so Solomon's the one that's going to build it. And then he just went ahead and made plans and built the temple. Uh, I'm not sure, but I just think that's an interesting point, that, you know, perhaps um, the temple should have never been built. You know, it should have always been a tabernacle, but then David just went ahead and did it anyway because of how he understood what God had told him. Um, but I'll, I'll address that again in a couple, of, a couple of minutes. So God never intended the temple. God actually built a tabernacle without any instruments. David then comes along and builds this temple in the desire of his own heart. God, God actually told him not to build it. And I suspect that the temple should have never actually been built. 
But where, where did musical instruments actually come from? Like why, why was Israel using musical instruments in the praise and worship in the temple of God in the Old Testament? Now, 1 Chronicles 6, we are given um, the numbering of the Levites. You see here in verse 1, it says the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, and then it gives their sons and things like that. Now, we often think, you know, why do these sort of passages exist in the, in the Old Testament? You know, these, what we would consider boring. But, you know, this, this is actually a pertinent verse to, to this topic here, because I wanted to show you here in verse um, 31, what it says here. So remember, this chapter is about the Levites, right? The, Le the, 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 the sons of Levi, the Levites. And then we get here to verse 31, and it says, And these are they whom David set over the service of song. I just want you to take note of that word there, the service of song, in the house of the Lord. So this is a service in the house of the Lord after that the ark had rest. And they ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the congregation with singing until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And then they waited on their office according to their order. And then it goes over who the singers were. And these are they that waited with their children of the sons of the Kohathites, Heman, a singer, the sons of Joel, the sons of Shemuel. So, you, you know, you've heard these, these names, you know, Heman, Asaph, when you read the Psalms, because these were the Levites that David appointed to be over the service of song in the house of the Lord. So one, one thing, I, two couple of things I want you to take note of here is one is this was a service in the house of the Lord. And number two, this was something that was appointed to the Levites only. So it was not just anyone played music in the house of the Lord in the Old Testament. It wasn't just, I mean, they all sung together, but there was, certain, there was a certain tribe, you know, that obviously they were given also the order of the other things of the temple as well, to move the tabernacle, to do the offerings and all that sort of stuff. Um, the, the priesthood of Aaron was, was part of the Levitical priesthood because Moses and Aaron are part of the tribe of Levi. So... The point I'm trying to make here is it's a service that was appointed for the Levitical priests. Um, and if you want to read more about, uh, it, it says here in verse 31, it says, And these are they whom David set over the service of song in the house of the Lord, after that the ark had rest. What that's referring to, if you remember in the battle of the Philistines, they took the ark out of the camp and then remember they lost that battle to the Philistines. The Philistines took the ark and then they got all those, you know, STDs and stuff like that. Um, and then they, then they were trying to give the ark back and it, and it rested at somebody's house, right, when they, when they sent the ark down the river. So David, he, he wants to go and get this ark and bring it back to Jerusalem. And you remember what happened? If you, if you know the story, you can read about it in basically in 2 Samuel 6, 1 Chronicles 13 and 15, he basically wants to go and get this ark. And as they're bringing the ark, you know, he appoints Levites to sing and to praise God. Because, you know, David was, was one all about music and singing, right? So he appointed these Levites to praise the Lord as they were bringing this cart back. And you remember the first time they tried to do it, they, brought, they didn't carry the ark properly. They put it on a new cart. So, you know, it's not like David was just putting it on an old cart. He was still trying to do it the best that he could. He put it on, an, you know, they made this new cart and they put the, put the ark on it, but they weren't doing it the right way. This is just how David thought he was going to praise the Lord by bringing the ark back. So he got musicians involved and it was all this fanfare. He put it on a cart and then they were driving this cart. You remember what happened? The Ark of the Covenant started to get all shaky and then Uzzah put his hand forth to steady the ark and then what happened? He, he got killed. And then they, were, then they were grieving and things like that and then he realized, hey, the Levites... Are meant to be carrying the ark so then the next time you know they were praising with instruments and he got the the levites to to carry the ark back and then he brought it back to a tent originally that he had made and then he built himself the house and then we get to first chronicles 17 where he says hey wait a second the ark of god is in a tent you know i live in a house i want to build a house so when it's saying here after the ark had rest it's saying that after the ark was put into the temple because remember the tabernacle was a place where the ark would keep moving but when the temple was built, the ark didn't move anymore. Now it was established in that temple. So it's saying here that the Levites, they were set over the service of song in the house of the Lord, which is the temple in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so you can read about that again and more in 2 Samuel 6, 1 Chronicles 13 and 15. 
Now, the, the other point I want to make is the Bible is, is amazingly clear that, that the instruments were David's idea. Like they, they were not something that came, that, that came of God before David. It was something that God used David to set into place. Um, and I'll show you here in 1 Chronicles 23. That's five. Let's go to a couple of these verses really quick. So um, this is David talking to Solomon, I believe. He says, moreover, 4,000 were porters. So he's talking about the service of the temple here. 4,000 were porters. 4,000 praised the Lord with the instruments which I made, said David, to praise therewith. Uh, let's go to Second Chronicles 7. It says here, and the, priests, and the priests waited on their officers. So again, only the priests and the Levites were over the service of song. The Levites also with instruments of music, of instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endureth forever, when David praised by their ministry, and the priests sounded trumpets before them, and all Israel stood. Nehemiah. So now we look at the rebuilding of the temple later on in the timeline. Nehemiah 12, uh, let's go down to verse 36. Look at this, and it says, And his brethren, Shemaiah and Azrael, Milalai, Gilalai, Maya, Nethaniel and Judah, Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra, the scribe, before them. So the Bible makes it a point to say, we're praising God with the musical instruments that David put in place. Uh, last one here, and this was actually uh, a verse against, is against uh, wicked nations. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that this verse is teaching that musical instruments are wicked, but it, it just makes the point here that chant to the sound of the viol, so the viol would be like a violin, and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. So there were trump they, Israel already had trumpets, right? Because they would use trumpets to go to war, but it was David that came up with these other instruments and different musical instruments in order to praise the Lord with, and he appointed the Levites uh, over that service. Now, First Kings, we go to the dedication of the temple. Now, I'm not making the point. So I'm not making the point that um, um, just because David appointed them, therefore that's the reason why we don't use them in church. That's not the point that I'm getting to. But, and the reason why I don't make that point, because even though I believe God did not intend the temple uh, he only intended a tabernacle. He did not intend the musical instruments that David put in place. I think we still see in the Bible that God sort of sanctioned what David did, right? Because even though God didn't ask David to do it and said, David, actually, don't build a house for me, when David perhaps misinterpreted what God told him and went ahead and built the temple anyway, we see that God actually sanctified and said in, as, as, as in a sense he approved of it right because when the temple was actually built the glory of the Lord came into the house and filled it so it says here so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord now if God would have thought the temple was sinful and wrong to do you know why would he then show up and say, hey, you know, you built a house for me and, and symbolize him dwelling in this place. So even though God did not intend David to build the temple, God commend, commended it. But I wonder if it's because even though God did not command him to build the temple, God still used what David did as an example, as a, as a sort of a, a, a physical example of what is done spiritually. Because it led, obviously, David to write psalms about things that are done in the temple and, you know, the beauty of the temple and things like that. And we know that in the New Testament, we are the temple of God. And things happen in this temple. And God wants this temple to be clean. God is going to dwell in this temple forever. So it's not until Revelation when we learn about the temple in heaven, but then because God allowed David to build this temple, maybe that's the reason why we have all these beautiful psalms that have a spiritual meaning of what the temple of God should be and we're able to apply that in the New Testament to the temple of God which is our body and which is the church. Uh, just a thought there. Now let's go to Second Chronicles. So we go to the story of Hezekiah and if you remember Hezekiah was a good king 
uh, or, or you know, good, right, uh, is in better than the, the wicked kings. And when he came into power, he repaired the temple of the Lord that was out of uh, action for quite some time. And we read about this in Second Chronicles 29, and we'll just read verses 20 to, 20 to 36. Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bullocks and seven rams and seven lambs and seven he-goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bullocks and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar likewise when they had killed the rams. They sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And they brought forth the he-goats for the sin offering before the king and the congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. So here's the context that they're, they're, they're doing the, the order of the service of the house of the Lord, right? The offerings and the burnt offerings. So the Levites are doing this. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with symbols, with psalteries, and with harps, according to the commandment of David, and of Gad the king seer, and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophet. So it's interesting there that even though God did not intend um, David to build this temple, he sanctified it when he um, glorified the house of the Lord when the temple was actually built. And it even says here that those commandments of David and, and the king seer and Nathan the prophet were actually commandments of the Lord. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets and Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offerings upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. And all the congregation worshipped and the singers sang and the trumpeters sounded and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So I want you to see here that the songs and the singing were in, al in alignment with the order of service with the sacrifices as well. They're all done together. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princess commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer, so the Psalms. And they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads and worshipped. Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, as many as were of a free heart, burnt offerings. And the number of the burnt offerings which the congregation brought was three score and ten bullocks, a hundred rams, two hundred lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated things were six hundred oxen, three thousand sheep. Um, but the priests were too few so that they could not flay all the burnt offerings. Wherefore their brethren, the Levites, did help them till the work was ended and until the other priests had sanctified themselves for the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. So you see here again, even when the priests did not have enough people to divide up all the burnt offerings and do them, it was only the Levites that helped. It wasn't the rest of the tribes because this is the, an order of the house of the Lord. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So, and look at this, so the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. So just take note again, I know I've been saying it a few times, but I want to make a point a bit later, that we see here that David appointed them for the service of the house of the Lord. In Second Chronicles 29, when Hezekiah re repairs the temple of the Lord, they make it a point that these were the instruments David put in place and they were for the service of the house of the Lord. And Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people for this thing was done suddenly. So they praised God because they pulled it all together in a short amount of time and did this for the Lord. Now what's the point I want to make with all that? So, you know, you could say if the Psalms command singing, you, you, could, you could say that as an objection and say, well, you're not dancing, you know, you're not, you're not um, worshipping in a sanctuary. But if somebody, let's say somebody takes that position, let's say somebody, because some churches do believe that their church is a holy place, right? I remember going to a Protestant church and it's like, they wouldn't allow children to run in the building or to run near the, the pulpit because they're like, oh, you know, the, the altar is holy. You know, in Catholic churches, right, they have that rope around the altar because that's like the most holy place where the, where the priest would stand and talk. 
and, and you'll, they'll say, oh, you know, kids shouldn't play and muck around in the building because it's the sanctuary. You know, you can, you can muck around in the kitchen, which is just next door, but not in the sanctuary. That's what they used to say in the Presbyterian church I would go to. So, you know, if a church is going to be consistent, then they say, well, that's the sanctuary. They're going to praise God. You know, they ought to be dancing and, and things like that. Then fine, right? Then, then you say, okay, well, then that's not an objection if you're going to do that properly. If the objection was what was never intended by God, um, then you could say, but then God did commend it, right? So even though God never intended it to happen, David did it, God liked it, so why wouldn't God like it in New Testament church, right? He liked it, you know, he might not have intended it, but that doesn't mean that it's uh, not right. And that's not my position. I don't necessarily think it's a sin if people are going to do it. I, I'm more of the position that it's not intended. Like, you know, if I was in the Old Testament, I would say, hey, we're meant to be worshipping God in a tabernacle. It's not in a temple. But, you know, we have a temple. It's not a sin. God has allowed it to happen. Um, but if we're looking at what God intended and what he actually wants uh, initially, uh, I think it's not instruments. And the point that I would sort of hang it on and what, I, what I, you may realise I'm sort of alluding to is that I believe that the temple was a shadow of spiritual things, right? And just like the sacrifices, the Levitical priesthood, the cleanness and uncleanness laws, the eating laws that would allow you whether or not to go into the temple, the sort of animals to sacrifice, just like they have been done away with the Levitical priesthood, I believe that the musical instruments that were part of the order of the service of the Lord are also been done away in the New Testament church. This is why I don't believe in tithing. You know, do I believe in giving to the local church? Of course, right? But it's like, I don't believe in tithing in the sense that it is a certain number, because in the New Testament, everything you have belongs to the Lord. And I don't believe in tithing in the sense that 10% must be given to a certain organization, because if somebody uses their money for the Lord in, in ways that they believe God would have them to use it, then, then they're probably giving more than somebody that's just giving 10% because they believe in tithing to a certain church. So this is why I don't personally believe in tithing. And I'll preach this sermon another time. But because I believe that tithing is part of the Levitical priesthood. It's, things, it's the offerings that they brought to the temple, to the tabernacle, that the Levitical priests would take part of. But now the Levitical priesthood doesn't exist. So technically you can't tithe anymore because there's no holy place to, to bring the tithe and, and there's no Levitical priesthood to, to partake of the tithe. Because it's not like, the tithe, like I'm the priest and I partake of your tithe because in the New Testament it's the priesthood of the believer. We're all priests, right? So it's not just, it's not just me that is meant to partake of the giving. I think it's, it should be approached another way. I do believe that bishops and, and, and deacons should get paid. I do believe people should give to the local church to, to support the work of God. But... It's not a tithe. It's, it's, it's something different. So my point would be that it's done away with, with the Levitical priesthood. And this is what we read about in Hebrews 9. He says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. So you see the service of the house of the Lord that was for the first covenant, which originally was meant to be for the tabernacle, which then David moved to the temple and a worldly sanctuary. So again, we've got the divine services and we've got a physical building, right? The sanctuary in the Old Testament. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So when the Old Testament is referring to the sanctuary, it is referring to this physical location. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden center, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people." The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing. So he's saying here that the fact that the high priest offered a sacrifice for himself as well as for the people, it's saying that the Holy Ghost is teaching here that that is not the way into the holiest of all. Because how is a priest with sin, he's making a sacrifice for himself, going to sanctify us? Um, it says here, 
which was a figure, so it's, it's a symbol, right? For the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. So I believe that the songs and the tithe and all these, they would fit into the carnal ordinance category imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So these were a temporary thing that Israel did until the time of Reformation. And what is that? Well, we read about it in the next verse. But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, right? So it's not the physical building in the Old Covenant or in the New Testament, um, but it's a, it's a heavenly building, right? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For of the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promises of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And it goes on to talk about that. So what is the time of reformation? It's not the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible is saying here that the testament is of force after men are dead. If you're still, it's like a will, right? If you're still alive, your will is not in force. It's when you're dead, then your will is put into place. So that's what it's using when it talks about the New Testament. When Jesus Christ died and he shed his blood, then the New Testament came into force. And that's why you see in the Gospels, he's, Jesus is still keeping the Sabbath. They're still going to the temple. He's still telling people to go and sacrifice as people are in the, in the law of Moses. He still, Jesus got circumcised and people were getting circumcised in the New Testament because the Old Testament was still in effect while Jesus was walking this earth. Once he died and he rose again, the New Testament then went into place. And that's why the veil of the temple was rent, right? Because there's no longer that veil that stopped people from going into the holy place. Jesus Christ, through his flesh, um, allowed everyone to enter into the holy place um, with Jesus Christ being our high priest. Anyway, so my point is, that is why I don't believe instruments are for the New Testament church. Because there's a lot of uh, symbolism with what was physical in the Old Testament and what is spiritual in the New Testament. So we have the high priest you know, in the Old Testament. We have Jesus Christ. We have the Passover lamb. We have Jesus Christ. We have the sanctuary. Our temple is the body of the Holy, uh, a spirit of the Holy, uh, temple of the Holy Ghost. You know, the Bible talks about when we give to the saints, that's like sacrifices to God, a sweet savor. Um, talks about, you know, our, our sacrifices to God are, 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 the, are the fruit of our lips giving praise to our God. It's not literally killing of an animal. And in the same sense, I believe that just like we had a physical temple in the Old Testament with a physical location of worship, with physical instruments that created praise and song, I believe in the New Testament, it is spiritual. There is a spiritual temple which is a spiritual location, right? Remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? It's not in this mountain or in that mountain. We're going to worship God in spirit and in truth because it's not the location. That's why when we, meet down, when we met down by the river, hey, that was just as holy and just as much church as us meeting here today. It's, and it's, in, if we're in a building, it's not like, you know, people come to this house and they're like, oh, this church is in a house. It's, like, it, it's, just, it's just where we're meeting. It's not like you have a fancy building, it's more holy. What's whole, what needs to be holy and what needs to be clean are the people of church. So it's not how beautiful this building looks or how clean this building looks or how fancy our equipment looks. It's, it's about, and it's not even about how fancy you look. You know, it's not about how nice your hair looks or how expensive your clothes are. It's about how clean and how righteous you are on the inside because it's spiritual righteousness. Just like it's a spiritual building. And guess what? I believe it's spiritual music. And instruments of music is not spiritual music. The spiritual music that God wants in the temple of God is the singing and the making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
Now let's just address the, the um, verses in Revelation. Because people will say, well, wait a second. You know, like they say, you know, God commanded instruments in the Old Testament. Well, why wouldn't God want them in the New Testament? So my answer to that would be, because it's part of the Levitical priesthood, and that's done away with, with the carnal ordinances. But I'll say, but then in, the Re in Revelation, you know, God is worshipped with instruments as well, right? And I mean, like, God, God enjoys being worshipped. So in his own temple in heaven, he's worshipped with instruments. Why would he not want to be worshipped with instruments on earth? I mean, like I said, I still believe it goes back to the fact that it's a physical location. I mean, the temple in heaven is a physical location. So, and I believe that God allowed the temple as a picture of what does actually happen in heaven, where there are harps, there are psalteries, and there is people praising God in a location with the temple. But what I want you to see here in Revelation 8 is if people are going to use the argument, well, if it's done in heaven, therefore it should be done in earth in the church, that again, like Psalms, is an inconsistent argument. Because when we see in Revelation and well, as well, and we'll see here in Revelation 8, which is also referring to what we see in the temple of God, it says here, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar. Now, heaven has an altar. So are you telling me that we should have an altar in church now? I mean, I guess some independent Baptist churches do think they have an altar, right? Come down to the altar. This is not an altar, my friend. Like, this is just a table, first of all. Um, this is not even a real pulpit. But, um, you know, this is not the altar. So you're not coming down to an altar and, you know, you can... There's many things that are wrong with believing that that is an altar. But, you know, the, 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 the uh, temple in heaven has an altar. Uh, having a golden censer. So there's these bowls and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints and sent it up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So I'm just making the point quickly there is, I don't think it's a sound argument to say uh, God likes being worshipped with instruments in heaven and since it's done in heaven we ought to do it here on earth. No, because there are other things that are done in heaven that we don't do on earth. There's the altar, there's the incense, there's the censer. So um, there are things that are done in heaven that are not necessarily done on earth. Um, and likewise the other way, like we're married and given in marriage. But in heaven there's no marrying or given in marriage. You know, we're going to be like the angels in heaven. So that's the reason why I prefer not to have instruments. And I'll go over just now quickly a few pros and cons um, of a cappella music um, when it comes to singing. Because obviously there are some, some cons to a cappella music. Uh, one is, you know, if people are not skilled in singing, sometimes it can be awkward. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's just the reality. I mean, we shouldn't think it's awkward. It's just our human nature, obviously, to hear other people. We shouldn't be right. I'm, to personally, I, I love it when somebody's singing out, even though they're not singing right, because I know that God loves it. You know, God loves to hear that person sing. And that's why I love to hear that person sing, because I know they're making melody in their heart to the Lord. Um, but, you know, if, it, if people are unskilled, you know, sometimes they need an aid. And I think this is where musical instruments do play a part, or recordings, they're used in order to aid people that may not have the musical talent to hold a tune so that they can sing holding a tune. But the difference with a musical aid and praising the Lord with instruments is a musical aid is there to get you to the point where you can sing. A musical aid is not there to replace singing. It's like if I had a recording, right? Like if, if, if we were tone deaf and I had a recording and we sung to that recording, that's helping us to stay in tune and to sing to God. But what if I just said, okay, we're not going to sing, we're just going to play, play the recording and now we're praising God. You know, that's silly, right? Because the recording does not praise God. And just like a, a computer does not praise God, a, a piano does not praise God. You know, it's something to aid the singers. Um, so if, if people are unskilled, obviously if you have musical instruments, it can be um, a bit awkward and, and it can be difficult for people to sing along if you don't have a strong song leader. Um, but, you know, that can be rem remedied by just people singing more and having a strong song leader that can lead the music. Another con might be, you know, the silence. The silence that happens, you know, after a song. And there's that awkward silence. Or, you know, if, if some churches take up a collection, we don't take up a collection. Uh, some churches take up a collection, it's just that there's just that awkward silence when things are happening. <laughs> you know, that could be seen as a, as a, as a con. Um, you know, during the Lord's... 
But you know, you know, during the breaking of bread and the cup, you know, that could be awkward when you're handing it out. I kind of like the fact that it's silent and it's a bit more reflective, you know. But, you know, I think the reason why people find this awkward is because they're used to church being a show. Do you know what I mean? I guess it's a bit of a show right now when I'm like, preaching to you guys. But then you know, this is why I like to get everyone involved. And this is why I want you guys to come along at 9 o'clock to get, get involved in the singing. Because, you know, otherwise, if you just come along for the preaching, it, it's just a show for you guys. You just come along and you see a show and then you leave. You know, you don't stay for the, you want to stay for the fellowship. You want to stay for the prayer. You want to stay for the, for the, for the singing. Because that's what, that's, that's the part of church that actually, that you can actually participate in rather than just be a spectator. Um, but I think we're so used to churches running the order of service like a show that we expect this, this entertainment and this music to fill the awkward silence, right? As opposed to, you know, you don't need awkward silences to be filled at a, at a family dinner. You know, you just, you, you, it's just silent, right? It just, it just doesn't need to be awkward. It's only awkward if you're ex expecting there to always be sound. Um, another kind might be, well, people that do not have a voice, so the dumb. Right? They, they, how can they sing? You know, at least a dumb person can, can play an instrument or music. But um, you know, I, I think uh, you know, this, is, this is an exception. Right? Like, this, doesn't, this doesn't change what God's will is for the New Testament. It's like you know, God wants you to be in a church, but if you're so terminally ill that you can't make it to a body, does that mean, oh, well, therefore it's okay not to be in church? No, no, it's, you still have to be in church. You just can't make it. It's like you know, we should be going soul winning, right? But if somebody doesn't have any legs and, and, and they can't walk, I mean, you can't say, well, therefore, we don't have to go soul winning because this person can't go soul winning. Do you know what I mean? So it's the same with that. It's, it's, we're meant to sing, but if somebody can't sing, it doesn't mean the intention to sing is not still there. But what are some pros to a cappella music and why I like it? Number one is there's no logistics, right? You don't have to worry about bringing instruments along, having space for instruments. It's, it, 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 it has a lot less space. You don't have to worry about the audio. You know, people that have orchestra, they have to have space for all those music instruments. Um, they have to have to spend all this time in music practice. You know, I, you know I'd rather we spent that time doing other things rather than spending time putting on a show. You know, that's why I don't, the only time I spend in, in this church gathering is for the preaching because I want it to be me. I don't, you know, usually it's like the night before I'm like choosing songs and like thinking what I want to do because I don't really put that much preparation into it, into the, uh, the, um, the appearance aspect of how this all looks because that's not what's important. Um, so there's no music practice, less space. It's cheaper because you don't have to buy expensive instruments. I mean, everybody has a voice. It's free. Um, <laughs> Another pro is, is everyone is singing, right? Because remember, the commandment is to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So that's a commandment to everyone to speak. So, so if you do come to church and you're not speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, I do believe that that's a sin. You, know, you, you ought to come to church and sing aloud, right? Sing unto the Lord, sing unto each other. But if you're sing, you know, you, you might say, well, it's because I'm, I'm just singing to the Lord, right? I'm singing in my heart, I'm singing softly because God can hear me. But the Bible says to teach and admonish one another, to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If somebody can't hear you singing, how are you speaking to them? Do you know what I mean? You've got to speak to them. And, and this is why, you know, you know, I remember when I first started singing in church, you know, I used to sing soft as well because I was kind of, kind of, you know, I don't sing with the same talent that I do today. I'm not saying that I'm talented at singing. I'm just saying I don't sing with the same confidence that I did today when I first was saved, obviously. But I, I got to the point where I wanted to sing loud because, and I didn't care like how I was singing because I realized that the reason why everyone else was singing soft is because everyone was singing soft. And I just figured if somebody would sing loud, maybe that would up the volume a bit. And you know what? If you would sing loud, and not care about what, you know, what people think of you. you know, the person sitting next to you is not caring about how you think. They're caring about how they, they sing. That's why they're singing soft. So if you would sing loud enough that they can't hear themselves, then they'll sing a bit louder. And then everyone will get better and we'll all sing. I don't know if you've ever been in a church where there's just a cappella singing. And the singing is so loud that you cannot even hear yourself sing. And I would love our church to get to that point where the singing is just so loud that I'm singing at the top of my voice and I can't even hear myself sing. That would be great. I would love that sort of singing. And I'd love to get to the point where our singing, you know, is even in parts and the different harmonies. I mean, that would be great. Uh, that would sound great. So I'm not against music being fancy. Um, I just think it's not intended to be fancy, made fancy with instruments. It's, it's intended to be made fancy with the human voice. 
Um, and that's where we can take that spiritual application of playing skillfully that, yeah, we ought to sing skillfully, uh, as skillfully as we can. And we ought to do it with the right attitude and the right intention, which is to praise God. And we do all things to the glory of God. So, you know, it's got everyone saying, because if you're playing a musical instrument, you have to be pretty talented to sing at the same time, right? I mean, I know there are people out there that can play the piano and sing, you know what I mean? So, but you'd have to be pretty talented to do that. But what if, you, what if you're playing a wind instrument? You know, you're playing a trumpet or a flute or an oboe or something like that. Then, then that person, they're never going to sing if they're always playing a musical instrument in the house of God. So they are never fulfilling that commandment to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And the last thing I like about a cappella music is I believe that it emphasizes the words. Because I believe what's important about music in the New Testament church is the doctrine that it teaches and the fact that we teach and admonish one another, right? We speak to one another. So the words are what, what, is, what is important. And I find in general, you know, it's just a generalization, churches that use musical instruments, it's a distraction from the words. And people start to, you know, the musician makes a mistake and people are thinking about how the musician plays, whether the mu musician is playing fast or too slow or too loud. Are they following the song leader? Are they not following the song leader? You know, they, how skillful are they playing? That, that should not be a factor at all in the New Testament church because the words are what are important. And the words are what sh we should be focused on and what we should be singing. And I believe a cappella music gives an environment where the words are most emphasized and that is what we reflect on. Now, I don't believe musical instruments are sinful. I do believe that there is a place for musical instruments. I'm not going to turn to all these verses, but I've got a list here. You know, musical instruments do have a place in life. So they're not a sin. And that's why it's, I'm not saying that if somebody has mastered in piano or mastered in musical instruments, like you wasted your life in something that God does not want you to do. I'm not saying, because there's a place for musical instruments. And, and where is that place? I believe it's a, there's a place in, in entertainment, right? And in celebration. Right, and that's why, you know, even the, the, the videos that I showed you this morning, there is music that is played along with those videos. But see, those videos are not New Testament church singing, right? Where it's a spiritual teaching and admonishing and speaking to one another. This is something that we watch for entertainment, to entertain the children and to help teach them the Bible verses, right? Um, or, you know, you're at a party. And remember, we looked at the prodigal son, didn't we? And we saw that when the celebration of the son coming back and there was music and dancing because it was a party. It was for entertainment because there is a place. There is a time to mourn and there's a time to dance, right? So dancing and music and musical instruments is not sinful. There's a time and place for it. It's when you want to entertain people like at a wedding or you want to entertain people for a party or to celebrate something. Um, I don't know if we turn to that verse in... in in Revelation when it refers to Babylon and when Babylon is judged and it says the voice of musicians shall no more be heard in thee and the voice of the of the of the quarry uh, of the of the house the guy that does the stones I can't remember mason. yeah the mason or whatever you, know, you, you can read about it in Revelation but you know it's it's because you know obviously Babylon is was an ungodly place where people were just partying all the time we think of parties we think of music and things like that um, Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2 8 talks about how he delighted in everything and he had musicians play for him. So there was that delight in, in that musical entertainment. You know, Saul had David to play for him. And we had also when the ladies came out, when David came back from battle with the timbrel and the dance, right, to celebrate the victory. And that's when Saul got upset with him because he was saying, oh, you know, look at these dancers. They're saying that David had slain 10,000, but me, they're only saying 1,000. What's with that? I don't like that song. That's what he's saying. So. I'm not saying that musical instruments are sinful. I say that they do have a place. I just don't believe they have a place in the New Testament church uh, for the reasons that I've stated. And the thing I just want to finish on here is, um, and, and, and just as a side note, as an addendum, because obviously this should never be the basis of our argument, but just an interesting thing to note. I wanted to read to you some quotes from historical sources and also quotes from religious leaders from uh, other denominations, right? Uh, and it's interesting to see that um, musical instruments is actually a new invention in the New Testament church. And a lot of historical sources actually note that musical instruments did not appear in the New Testament church until like five or 600 AD. And also the fact that a lot of quotes from some, you know, respected quote unquote, because Spurgeon is gonna be in here, but you know, respected quote unquote religious leaders um, that actually did not use musical instruments in their, um, in their worship services. 
And I don't make the point to say, well, this is the basis for which I don't have instruments because, you know, I don't care. Even if I was to stand alone on the Word of God, I would still have no, not have musical instruments, even if everybody used musical instruments because of what the Bible says. But this is just, I'm just saying this is just not one of those positions. This is not one of those positions where there is a minority of people. There are actually a lot of people that take the position that I've taught you this morning for, dif for differing reasons, but I believe the reason that I gave, reasons I gave you this morning are the most sound. So let me just read you a couple of these. These are some historical sources. Um, it says here, all our sources deal amply, and, and, I'll, and I'll put the link of the website that I got these from, and, and you can check them out yourself. I didn't fact check these, so that's why I'm not basing my argument on these, but I'll read them to you. All our sources deal amply with vocal music of the church, but they are cherry, I guess that means void, right? They are cherry with mention of any other man manifestations of musical art. The development of Western music was decisively influenced by the exclusion of musical instruments from the early Christian church. Here's another one. Only singing, however, and no playing of instruments was permitted in the early Christian church. There can be no doubt that originally the music of the divine service was everywhere entirely of a vocal nature. We have no real knowledge of the exact character of the music which was formed, which we have no real knowledge of the exact character of the music, which formed a part of the religious devotion of the first Christian congregation. It was, however, purely vocal. And I'll put all these sources on the blog and you can check it out yourself. Both the Jews in their temple service and the Greeks in their idol worship were accustomed to sing with the accompaniment of instrumental music. The converts to Christianity accordingly must have been familiar with this mode of singing. But it is generally admitted that the primitive Christians employed no instrumental music in their worship. So that's some, some historical sources. Now, now this is what is, I think, find interesting. These, these, these are quotes from religious leaders that are quote-unquote respected. Um, here's a Catholic source. The first Christians were of too spiritual a fiber to substitute lifeless instruments um, for or to use them to accompany the human voice. Here's from a Greek Orthodox source. The execution of Byzantine church music by instruments, or even the accompaniment of sacred chanting by instruments, was ruled out by the Eastern Fathers as being incompatible with the pure, solemn, spiritual character of the religion of Christ. Presbyterian. Uh, who's this? This is John Calvin. Musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting up of lamps, the restoration of the other shadows of the law. The Papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this, as well as many other things from the Jews. Men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends to us by the apostles is far more pleasing to him. So that's John Calvin's commentary on, um, on, on, a, on verses in the Bible about singing. So, and, I, and you know, I agree with that. I, I, that he, he has obviously linked up the musical instruments with the uh, Levitical priesthood. Here's uh, Adam Clark. He's a Methodist commentator. Music as a science I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music. And here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity. Martin Luther called the organ an ensign of Baal. Um, and here's Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon says, I, and, and this is his response to 1 Corinthians 14, 15, where it says, I will pray to God in the spirit. I'll pray with the understanding. And he says, I'll sing with the spirit. I'll sing with the understanding. This is Charles Haddon's response. I, was soon as a, I would as soon attempt to pray to God with machinery as to sing with him, to sing to him with machinery. So he's saying, I'm not going to pray to God with machines. Why would, I, why would I praise God with machines? I'm going to pray to God with my voice. And this is my favorite. And I'll end on this one. This is, this is um, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. He says, I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they are neither heard nor seen. <laughs> so that's my favorite one. I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they are neither heard nor seen. And, and I, in my position right now, I agree with that one. I've, no, I've got no objections to them, as, as long as they're not heard or seen in church. Anyway, I hope that was interesting for you. I hope that gives you a background 
as to why we don't use musical instruments. So it's not just because we don't have the talent. It's not just because, you know, I love how much my voice sounds. And it's not because I'm just totally ignoring the verses in the Psalms. I think there is a perfectly good, re perfectly good reason for why we don't follow the Psalms as explicitly as people would want us to believe. And, and, and that is the basis for why we do that here. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Um, again, just thank you for uh, giving us direction in how we are to um, order the, in the New Testament house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We thank you, Lord, that, um, you know, it's not about the skill. It's not about how we sound, but Lord, it's about the heart and about how we do things spiritually. Lord, I pray that as we cleanse the inside, the outward will be clean also and help us, Lord, to, to be a witness for you. We thank you. Pray that you would continue to use this church. I pray, Lord, that this, these sermons build up your people and feed your flock. And uh, Lord, help them to walk as you would have them to walk. Uh, that, Lord, that they would be accountable to you and not to just the people of this church. Um, and Lord, I pray as well that you would work on me. Uh, I know there are plenty of things that, that I can improve in my life. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your love. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.